Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on today's webcast. I'm Sierra Bine. I'm a content editor and the author of the Globe and Mail's climate newsletter. I'll also be moderating today's discussion. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Globe and Mail's headquarters is located on the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Métis Nation, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is part of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum. A treaty agreement is that says we're protecting the land and all its resources. By being on this land, we are responsible for upholding all of its treaties. For today's discussion, we're looking at how businesses across all sectors of Canada's economy are declaring goals of net zero emissions, in some cases by 2030. Though approaches vary, the common denominator in the push to net zero is energy. In sectors such as manufacturing, mining, resources, Energy represents the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions and is the most practical area to tackle. Today's discussion will provide insights on the role that technology plays in accelerating decarbonization, as well as the energy transition growth opportunities that exist. We aren't anticipating any technical issues, but we appreciate your patience should any arise. If you need technical help, please click, click the help desk icon button at the bottom of your screen. During the last 10 minutes of the panel, we will be answering audience questions. So if you have a question for our panelists, please type them in the virtual Q&A box. On behalf of the Globe and Mail, I would like to recognize Microsoft for supporting today's event. Uh, now I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. Uh, I'd like to start off with Kim Lawrenson, who is the, vice, the, the Senior Vice President of Enterprise Strategy and Energy Markets at OPG. Jamie Dismore is the Energy and Resource Industry Lead at Microsoft Canada. Kendall Dilling is president of Pathways Alliance, and Binu Jay Kumar is director of electricity at the Pembina Institute. Thank you guys for your time today. Thank you for joining us. Um, why don't we get started by having each of you tell us a little bit about what it is that you guys do. We're all getting uh, too Canadian here. <laughs> sorry, I should, I should say. Kendall, why don't you kick us off? <laughs> The Canadian standoff. Uh, good morning, everyone. Kendall Dilling, um, such a pleasure to be here and I uh, look forward to this conversation. So I'm a wildlife biologist uh, by background. I spent my career working, I guess, from the inside out in the oil and gas industry, trying to drive environmental uh, performance and sustainability in the organizations I've worked for over the years and find myself now in the very fortunate position of leading the Oil Sands Pathways Alliance, which is, uh, you know, in some ways I feel like the culmination of, of 30 years of, of work by myself and many people in the industry who've uh, been instrumental in, in helping move the thinking along in the industry to get to a point where uh, we were prepared to embrace a net zero challenge. And so about a year and a half ago, Pathways was stood up. Um, we represent the six largest oil sands companies, and really it's the embodiment of that net zero by 2050 commitment. And, and we spent several years in engineering and in the back rooms, making sure that we had a viable, technically sound trajectory and path for net zero, which we are fortunate to have in the oil sands. And we are well, you know, well on our path uh, in, in, in the sense of at least for sure doing all the foundational work. And, you know, the one thing we'll talk about a little bit today is these are big infrastructure projects, right? Um, the Just uh, the first phase of our net zero plan by 2030 to reduce about 25% of our emissions is a $24 billion undertaking. And so there's a lot of work in engineering and regulatory and indigenous consultation and uh, regular approvals that you have to go through to get to the point where you're actually putting steel in the ground, but we are hard at work on the, those the initial phases of what we need to do to get the get these projects moving forward. Thank you, um, Jamie. Can I call on you next? Absolutely, Jamie Dinsmore. I am responsible. I lead the energy and resources team for Microsoft Canada. I've been with Microsoft just over six months, and really one of the reasons I came to Microsoft was because of the major investments they're making in the energy industry. Energy and resources for us includes oil and gas, power and utilities, and mining. And what they're doing to really accelerate net zero is phenomenal. 
Prior to that, I was with uh, Siemens and I had the pleasure of being president and CEO of Siemens Industry Software ULC. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Kim, can I throw it to you? Sure, thanks. Uh, so Kim Lauritsen, uh, thanks very much for having me on the panel. I'm with Ontario Power Generation. I oversee the enterprise strategy and energy markets teams. Um, we are the largest clean electricity generator in Ontario. We have a diverse portfolio of nuclear, hydro, gas, solar, and biomass electricity generation, and we deliver over 50% of Ontario's power. Um, a large part of my role and my time lately is, is dedicated to energy transition and net zero goals. OPG has a net zero by 2040 target, but we also have um, a goal to enable the markets in which we operate to achieve net zero by 2050. So it's a very exciting time to be in this space. Thanks, and Benu. Hey folks, thanks for having me here. Um, so I started my career as a plant engineer, but I don't get to crawl around turbines anymore. I work on energy policy right now at the Pemina Institute, uh, which is a nonprofit clean energy think tank. And we work across many different economic sectors as you define them, Sierra, at the beginning. Uh, right now, my team is focused on um, electricity policy. So we're working on advancing solutions to help Canada achieve a net zero grid by 2035, and one that is actually reliable and affordable. So it's not an easy task, but we work with great colleagues in industry and government. And we're working on not only cleaning the grid, but also supporting electrification of other sectors so we can bring down the emissions of other sectors like transportation, buildings, industry. And uh, currently, just like everyone said, there's so much happening in this space. There's a lot of important policies being designed at the federal level. There's a lot of heavy lifting that the provinces are doing in this sector too. Um, so it's really an exciting time to be working in this space. Thanks, reliable and affordable uh, music to my ears. Mm -hmm. uh, so our first question actually is, you know, I think investors really want assurance um, that Canadian tech is gonna break through. And, you know, maybe the federal budget helps with that. Um, but what what is it that, that you guys think that is holding investors back? Um, is there anyone who might, yeah, I see Jamie nodding. Would you be interested in tackling that one? Well, I think there's a couple things. And, um, you know, obviously, Bit more clarity as it as it as we relate to regulations and policy, I think would definitely help. And I believe there's some hesitation in context of the innovation in Canada, and I don't think that's merited. I think we have exceptional people, and we're leading innovation in a number of key areas in clean tech. So it it also is highlighted what's very topical right now is artificial intelligence and the role that plays. And Canada has really exceptional talent as it relates to AI. And I think it's going to be a critical factor in moving and, and really making deliberate investments, leveraging technology in order to achieve net zero across the energy industry and across multiple industries as, as Binu also outlined. Uh, anyone else on investing, Canadians, Kendall? Yeah, I'll just I'll add on what Jamie said. Um, <clears throat> and this one may be a more merited criticism of Canada, and that's that we have collectively really struggled in the last decade to build big projects, to get big infrastructure done. And there's myriad and complicated reasons for that, but uh, the reality is I think that's part of the reason why there is some skepticism. Uh, it's one thing to, you know, set goals and even mobilize or, or make, you know, capital available and funding support available. It's another thing to actually get through a very complicated regulatory process and get steel in the ground. And so I, I you know, I think that's part of the reason why investors are on the sidelines. Um, you know, and also let's be honest, like the Americans um, just set the bar really high with the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. And there's a massive sucking sound right now coming out of the US and that's sucking from all around the world, capital and the best and brightest minds too. A lot of Canadian clean tech companies have pivoted and are almost solely focused on, on US projects now. And can, you know, that's a wake up call for Canada. We've got to really step up. And I am really encouraged by the Volkswagen battery plant that was announced recently. I think that's a really good example of where Canada did come together and met the IRA uh, in, in terms of 
economic incentives and we're successful in getting that in Canada. And that's going to create now spawn a whole massive upstream investment in critical and rare minerals that will support that and, and doing the value add and the whole supply chain in Canada. I just think that's a wonderful analog. We now need to apply that to other sectors as well. Um, if I can, can just I, build up. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to build off what Kendall was saying there too. I think there's two sides to this too, right? I think uh, it's really great to see Canada now trying to match the IRA in its own way uh, and uh, uh, setting up those incentives. The next step is actually clarity on what those incentives look like and how they will be implemented. But that's a great start. But the other side of that is also providing policy certainty in terms of regulations. Um, and this is where, you know, in the electricity sector, for example, the Canadian government is designing a clean electricity regulation, which will put forward emission standards for the power sector. And, and those type of regulations create great certainty for investors or industry so they understand what type of technologies to invest in and like Kendall was saying many of these projects are really long lead time projects so you need that certainty up front uh, so that the right investments can be made. I might just add one more thing from the electricity sector and I think I, I echo everything that's been said about that, that policy certainty. I mean a big thing with these long lead projects for electricity as well um, is just de-risking the revenues um, and not all of that. Some of that comes from policy certainty, but um, in particular, when you're investing in large, long-term, capital-intensive projects, there needs to be line of sight and de-risking of what that investment is. So, And, and that uh, revenue stream comes from different sources in different jurisdictions, but I think that's pretty critical to get uh, that early funding to get these projects off the ground. Yeah, yeah that balance is so important. Sorry, and sorry, Sierra. It, it, it really is. You know, we're, we're, we're in the business of, of, of making sure that we have growth inside of commercial organizations and need to balance that with net zero and and the effects of, of, of the climate crisis. So it really does come at balance and, and the certainty would help a lot in terms of making sure that those investments can take place. I was going to say, especially if we're interested in other countries wanting to like invest in this technology down the road. Um, the next question we were hoping to explore was: Should the should the goal of technology to be to get to a point where we're able to phase out fossil fuels? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to jump on that one right away. <laughs> it's a it's a tough one. On that one. <laughs> Go ahead, Kim. For, from my perspective, again, you know, I've got a, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll probably be bringing the electricity system view uh, pretty strongly. And also, that's a different view depending on which jurisdiction you're in, depending on the starting point. And so, you know, Ontario looks different to other Canadian provinces, which looks different, again, uh, to the US and, and globally. But um, if we're going to achieve net zero, then yes, I think when it eventually when it comes to unabated uh, fossil fuels with unabated emissions, you know, eventually uh, we will need to find a way to to reach that net zero, whatever that definition looks like. Um, fully phasing it out. I mean, I'm pretty convinced with the amount of uh, the the focus on carbon abatement technology, funding for clean technology, and customer interest that that's going to play a, st a strong part of achieving achieving those climate goals. But I think we also need to be very careful about the the, the pace and the phase out and that it's controlled um, and that it doesn't introduce unnecessary or unacceptable risk if we do it too early. You know, in, in Ontario, um, while fossil fuels provide less than 10 percent of our overall electricity, natural gas still plays a very important role in providing that reliability and affordability to the grid. So I think, again, that balanced, you know, achieving it in a balanced way will be very important. I'm, I'm sure everyone's expecting me to come in and uh, take a contrarian view as the oil and gas guy on the call, but I, I actually don't. But I really like the qualification that Kim added, which is unabated. Yes, it, we have to stop the unabated combustion of fossil fuel as soon as we reasonably and feasibly can. The other point I would add, though, is that there are lots of non-combustion end uses for oil and gas, particularly heavy oil. So in the context of oil sands, you know, everyone assumes that the market's going to just disappear for oil altogether, but there is an indefinite market for asphalt, petrochemical feedstock, growing carbon fiber market. And so in a, from an oil sands perspective, we 100% we know that oil demand will decline over time and it needs to, but there will continue to be 
a use. I mean, even in the IEA's most aggressive net zero by 2050 scenario, there's still significant oil demand in 2050. And so as long as that demand and market is there, we think the world is better served by that coming that barrel coming from Canada as a very responsibly developed barrel and increasingly carbon abated. So, uh, you know, as we, if we are successful in our plans with pathways and we can deliver you know, we can decarbonize the production of our barrels here, well, then the world's clearly better off with those barrels um, serving that world market. So I, I agree with everything everyone said. And we, and natural gas, and, and, and I'm not in the power generation business, but in a lot of the provinces that don't have, you know, massive hydro or nuclear options, uh, natural gas with CCS has clearly got to be part of the grid mix for some period of time too. So I think it's all about the balance that Jamie mentioned. Awesome. Uh, anyone else? I can, yeah, be new. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just add one more nuance on that too. I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad everyone's talking about net, right? So it's about, we understand that there will be some emissions and uh, we have to make sure that there is enough of emissions reduction from the atmosphere to make sure that it's actually a net zero. I think the critical decision here is going to be where, how do we sequence which sectors create those emission reductions. In some sectors like electricity, we're lucky. We have clean energy options that are ready to deploy right now. There are some other sectors like cement and steel where these emission reductions are going to come later as technologies are still being developed, right? And so I think it'll be important to make sure that the pace is advanced in sectors where it's easier and then we provide the support that's needed in the sectors where it is going to be more difficult. Thanks. I'm actually going to stick with you, Binu, for a second. On our prep call, we talked a bit about corporate procurement of renewals, um, having an important role in decarbonizing the grid. Could you tell us a little bit more about the tactics used in Alberta to encourage corporate procurement? Um, take it yeah, away. for sure. Maybe a little bit of context for folks. You know, Canada has a really clean grid. I just want to, I, I found this fact really interesting. So, if you compare Canada amongst the G20 countries, we're actually near the bottom of the pile in terms of wind and solar deployment. But despite Canada's poor performance there, the province of Alberta is actually a bit of a shining star. Um, it's been the province that has been leading renewable energy growth in Canada for the last five years. And exactly what's led to that is the corporate procurement that you've mentioned. Almost everything, it's I think over 90 nine percent of the installed megawatt capacity is because of corporations like Amazon, Telus, RBC entering into contracts with developers to purchase their renewable energy. And what allows this to happen in Alberta are a few different pieces. Um, it has a deregulated market which allows any independent power producer to come and install generation without the need for a central procurement process or planning process. The second thing is there is retail choice in Alberta. So that allows consumers to choose who they buy electricity from. So corporations can then go ahead and enter into electricity contracts with a provider of their choice. The third thing, and this is really critical, is the price of energy in Alberta is really transparent and it's tied to the actual cost of generating energy. So when corporations like Amazon are looking or Microsoft are looking to enter into contracts, they can understand what the real price of electricity in the market is and enter into a contract that makes sense for them. Now, I'm not going to advocate that every jurisdiction deregulates their market to the level that Alberta has. I don't think you need to do that. There are creative solutions around that if you meet these three criteria in different ways. And I think there's really promising things that are already starting to happen in uh, provinces like Saskatchewan and Nova Scotia. They're piloting their own ways of doing corporate procurement. And my understanding is Ontario is also starting to look at these mechanisms. But I'm sure Jamie has more to say on corporate procurement. Yeah, there's there, there's lots. I mean, Microsoft is a big consumer of electricity, mm -hmm. but very focused, as I said at the beginning, with regards to sustainability and net zero. So the targets are aggressive. Microsoft has been leading in that area. They've entered into a, a, a number of of renewable energy purchase agreements uh, with ATCO and a number in Canada. We've also gone into clean energy credits with OPG. So a, a, a new um, kind of entry. I think we were the first in the world to 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 actually enter into it, which really on an hour by hour basis would certify and validate that they were 
clean energy procured electrons that we were using in inside of our data centers. And that really goes to the Microsoft vision with regards to the 100-100-0 commitment, where 100% of our electricity consumption 100% of the time is matched by zero carbon energy purchases. So it, it's a big push that, that Microsoft has. Um, and, uh, and and I think is really making an impact in, in Ontario and, and, and around the world. Awesome. Um, I'll move on unless anyone else wants to chime in on the procurement question. Um, but I did want to move on and ask about nuclear and what is changing about nuclear energy? What are the concerns, but also what are the opportunities there? Um, I'm going to throw it to Kim to start. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I'd love to start this one. Um, so the most significant thing that's changing about nuclear technology uh, is the progress on advanced nuclear reactors and, and the different use cases for nuclear that these technologies allow. So small and micro sized nuclear reactors, um, and these can range anywhere from like a five megawatt off grid solution to a 300 megawatt grid scale solution offer the opportunity to deploy nuclear in areas where demands um, are lower than like traditional large scale, nu scale nuclear. So for context, a 300 megawatt SMR would uh, small, that's a small re modular reactor would power roughly 3,000, 300,000 homes. So scale that down to five megawatts, roughly 5,000 5, homes. Um, but in addition to the size, some of the advanced nuclear technology um, that's being developed is also capable of providing both electricity and steam that can be used for industrial processes. And that provides a huge opportunity for industrial businesses to decarbonize um, some of their other processes, uh, reducing the use of gas to generate steam. And to Binu's point earlier, you know, if we if we think carefully about the sequencing of what we decarbonize, um, th that dual purpose is going to be um, is going to open a huge opportunity for heavy industrial. And OPG is leading the deployment of all of these technologies uh, in, in Ontario and beyond. Um, I can go into, I'm, I'm happy to go into concerns as well. Maybe I'll pause and see if anybody else uh, wants to chime in first on just the opportunities. I think nuclear represents a vast number still. I, I think it's roughly 10% of our of our clean energy and it it's, it's absolutely essential. I think perhaps there's still bad press as it relates to nuclear, but it, it does play a, a critical role in, in our in our journey to, to net zero. And getting to remote communities when you're talking about SMRs and being able to service that more effectively, it it, it really is essential. Last comment I'll make, because I read it this morning, but uh, kind of ties them both together. Microsoft entered into a power purchase agreement um, with a nuclear fusion company today, which which was rather exciting. So the leveraging of in you know new technology that's that's coming to the forefront. That was in the Toronto Star. I actually wasn't aware of it until I read it, but it was uh, rather topical. And uh, you know our reliance on on different sources is is absolutely critical so that we can we continue to have a resilient grid and uh, and make sure that quite honestly that that we're not dependent on on just one source and can go through the decarbonization in a systematic way as, as outlined. And maybe before you go into the challenges, I'll just add on one of the use cases that you referred to is in the oil sands. Uh, we're a large consumer of energy and we're quite interested in uh, potential for small modular nuclear. Uh, as you mentioned, they can be configured for different use cases. And in our case, we don't actually need the electricity. We need heat, we need the thermal energy to generate steam for our operations and you can design it accordingly. So so we're, uh, you know, definitely working hard on and, and intrigued by that possibility. I'll now segue it back to you by saying what we see is the challenge and you can then speak to this much better than I could is in Alberta, particularly as a you know non-nuclear jurisdiction, you're really starting from ground zero in terms of regulatory a, pro a regulatory process and stakeholder acceptance and all those kind of things. So that's that's the challenge on our on our end. I would say is not so much the technology, the economics also are you know that's something we're still working through. But it's probably the the social license and the regulatory piece that it's the bigger challenge. 
Sure. Yeah. And I know, I mean, from a regulatory perspective, I think with a, you know, a Canadian, a strong Canadian regulator, I think that 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 is, you know, supporting the various provinces that um, that were in good shape to support, uh, you know, jurisdictionally across Canada, what that regulatory build out looks like. But I know that there's also a lot of uh, integration and and support globally now between regulators for countries that have no nuclear at all and how do they build up their regulation and I know that there's a lot of collaboration happening um, in that space. I mean the other thing that I'll uh, touch on obviously I, th I think the concerns around nuclear writ large are fairly well known um, and, and you on your point on social license, our challenge is really to break down the misconceptions and the fears um, by broadening our, our our efforts to educate and connect people to the benefits of nuclear. For almost 60 years, nuclear has been safely powering Ontario without greenhouse gas or smog emissions. Uh, it uses far less land than other generation, generation sources, and it's not weather dependent. Um, and, and that's not to say that, you know, it needs to be an all nuclear solution. We need we need an all hands on deck approach. But um, as we with with the degree of build that we need, I, that land use and that energy density is, is another opportunity that I didn't touch on. Now, like all forms of energy, it creates it creates waste or byproducts, uh, but they're very small in volume. They're safely managed very rigorously regulated uh, and fully funded. So, I'll, and I'll also add that some of the byproducts are actually extremely useful. Um, medical isotopes that can be used in medical in imaging, uh, other isotopes can be used in quantum computing. So, uh, breaking down some of the mis misconceptions, I think will be really important, um, you know, in particular as nuclear moves into other jurisdictions. We're very encouraged by the ongoing public support for nuclear that we've enjoyed for a long time in Ontario, but we're also starting to see attitudes shift around the world, uh, including in Europe, as nations come to view clean energy as a national security issue, really. Which is a transition into my next question. Um, you know, Ukraine's impact on European oil pipelines. It, it kind of felt like a wake up call to the industry after years of promising to move forward with renewables. Um, what role do you guys think that the war has played in the transition? I guess what I would offer is that it has brought, um, I would say, a degree of uh, realism back into the dialogue when you you know look at the very real challenges being faced in Europe right now it's a reminder of what happens if you don't do this in an orderly and and sensible fashion uh, the, you might hear the word trilemma getting used these days uh, and it, it really does resonate because this is a trilemma right because it's it's not yeah I mean yes we've there is a very real climate imperative that we have to address and that's incredibly important but energy security also matters and energy affordability also matters. And so anyone can, I guess, pick one of those and, and go you know, on an ideological basis, think that that is the only thing that matters. But at some point, the adults need to get in the room and say, listen, this is going to collapse if we don't do this in a sensible and, and well thought out way. And that's where you know, addressing all three of those simultaneously is critical because if if we, uh, you know, and this is a real risk, everything we're talking about with decarbonizing energy systems is is doable and it's absolutely imperative that we do it, but it is going to add a lot of cost. And if energy costs get so out of reach that the average Canadian can't heat their home or cool their home or drive their car, that's that's going to slow things down more than anything else. Well, we have to do something that's sustainable for, for everybody. And consumers, by the way, have to be part of this too. And you know, everyone's uh, uh, everyone everyone's thinks this is all good as long as it's someone else's responsibility to pay for it or to change their lifestyle. But everybody has to be engaged. This is an all hands on deck uh, deck challenge that we have to face together. Thanks. Very well said. I I I think. Efficiency, and you know, I come from a lens of technology. I have over 25 years experience with regards to technology, but I think it plays a critical role. We have to be more efficient with this transition and in every sector because we need that balance. We we can't go all in on 
on just one. It's got to make sure that we've got that balance across and certainly seen that, you know, with, with, with some of the challenges with regards to what's going on in Ukraine. But, but we have an opportunity, I think, to be more efficient, to be able to be <laughs> cognizant of some of the emissions, to be able to leverage data, data being the new oil, obviously hear that often in an energy conversation, but, but it is something that, that we can affect change by leveraging what's there now and make sure that we're empowering people so that they have a lens with regards to what they can do in real close to real time in order to maximize and, and be as efficient as possible and reduce that carbon footprint as we go through the transition. Maybe if I can just build off some of Kendall's points on cost too. Um, I think there's sort of two takeaways for me on what's happening here with Ukraine. Um, one is it's really making apparent the volatility of, um, of cost of fossil fuels like uh, when it's a commodity like gas. And it, it connects that to, I mean, like Kendall said, the issue of energy security. Uh, but it makes an interesting case then for electrification for sectors that may be overly dependent on one specific fuel source. Um, and so it's a good case for why we need to diversify. And the second takeaway, and it's sort of a building off of that, is the response you're seeing in Europe. Um, there was a lot of conversation happening in Europe around energy efficiency, renewables, but it has accelerated. Um, so Germany, for example, within months of um, the Russia situation coming to play, they announced their intention to get to a net zero grid by 2035. Europe has this 455 package, which is like a holistic package of a whole bunch of incentives to accelerate clean energy transition. So I think it's also an interesting takeaway for all of us, like when push comes to shove, how quickly some of this transition can happen when intentions are all aligned Thank you. Uh, I wanted to throw it, you know, to the group. Um, if you could tell us about how your organizations are working with Indigenous communities, um, you know, many of these communities are still off the grid and, you know, maybe also how does that factor into the clean energy transition? So a nice double barrel um, for anyone who can. Um, Kim, do you mind if I? Sure. First yeah. for that? No. Uh, happy to start. OPG is very active. Um, so at, at OPG, we believe climate change and, and reconciliation really need to move hand in hand. Uh, and we're moving, we're, we're working with Indigenous community, communities in a number of ways. So on our existing assets, we have four different partnerships in place with Indigenous communities across the province. And in those partnerships, the communities have a direct ownership interest in a generating asset. They earn a revenue from those operations. We also have a reconciliation action plan that we released in 2021, and that includes a commitment to deliver one billion dollars of investment over the next 10 years to Indigenous businesses and communities. Um, for our new developments, we're also committed to early and meaningful engagement with communities where we plan to develop and operate new facilities in order to build relationships and gain support for those um, projects. And finally, when, when you mention off-grid, we do have experience um, helping to facilitate an Indigenous community, um, to an off-grid community to reduce its reliance on diesel fuel uh, by helping develop a, a solar and battery microgrid. And you know, with the advancements that we were talking about earlier in nuclear technology and that kind of micro nuclear reactor scale, that could play a really important role um, going forward to help some of these communities um, who are off grid to decarbonize and reduce, reduce their reliance on diesel. So there's a huge amount of opportunity in that area. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just add on that, Kim. Uh, and I agree so much with your statement that uh, the this, this potential wave of decarbonization investment coming across the country is a a huge opportunity, and I think I think the the best indigenous economic reconciliation lever that we we have at our disposal. And it's not just that it can bring in a lot of investment and create a lot of jobs and a lot of economic and economic opportunity. It's also all being spent to improve our environmental outcomes, which is obviously a core value to Indigenous communities. So when you bring those things together, I think it's a real opportunity. And certainly in the oil sands and in, in our pathways project, we are 
uh, working very, very closely with the communities in northeastern Alberta and see this as a way to engage them in a at, at the and you know put it on steroids so to speak right i mean we have a long history of working with these communities and uh they have developed uh, a lot of capacity really impressive uh, skills in in business and the services they provide the sector and starting to participate in those economic opportunities but we're also seeing more and more of these equity partnerships now and i know opg is doing that um, Enbridge just did a <clears throat> significant uh, equity deal with the Indigenous communities on their pipeline system in the Northeast. Uh, Suncor, one of our member companies, has done multiple equity deals. And I, I think that's kind of paving a way for a new level of partnership and engagement with the, the First Nations and Métis communities in, in these projects. So over and above the job opportunities and contract and construction type opportunities, you'll now layer in this um, element of of a sustainable ongoing revenue source for those co those communities, which is so critical for them to to achieve their 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 objectives. If I may, Sierra, um, at oh. Pemina, um we're specifically working with remote communities, and um, you know so these are we're finding. And this is just adding on top of what Kim and Kendall are saying, uh, but our focus has been particularly in remote communities in the north that live in very isolated regions. And what we're finding is they depend on decade-old and inefficient technologies that burn carbon-intensive diesel. So our, our efforts have been around supporting their efforts to reduce their reliance on diesel and advance energy sovereignty at the same time. So I just wanted to take a moment to highlight some of the systemic challenges we're finding our colleagues in these communities facing. Um, you know, it's around uh, the status quo of the energy policy and how utilities operate and the lack of engagement currently with communities. There's still misalignment between federal and provincial programs and policy, so that's really difficult for them to navigate. Um, and there's still a lot to be done in terms of the regulatory framework. There's a lot of restrictive regulations that prevent Indigenous uh, companies and leaders from doing more uh, projects with Indigenous ownership. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities there, like Kendall was saying, but there are some fundamental systemic challenges also that we need to address um, to unlock the potential there. Thank you. And I'm sensitive of time. We have great audience questions I see coming in already. I had one more group question, which is just if we move too fast in the transition, we talked a few points earlier, but what are the biggest risks that we might face? Maybe each of you could give us one um, idea. Kendall, maybe I can throw it to sure. you. Um, I mean, I think cost, right, is the, the biggest risk of of moving too fast, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, you're not gonna get every single project, every every single technology, right? There is gonna be a bit of a throw it all against the wall. We are facing a climate imperative. We have to get out of our comfort zone and move faster and try more things. But there still has to be some pace and discipline in that, or we could throw a whole lot of money at this, increase the cost of the consumer enormously, and actually not show much for it on the back end in terms of uh, emission reductions. So that that I think is the risk of moving too fast. Thanks. Anything I have to build on that. Uh, the cost, I think, again, cost and reliability from an electricity perspective. Again, I'll take the Ontario lens and not all jurisdictions look the same, but electricity in Ontario only count, accounts for two to three percent of all emissions. And so if we move too fast in that transition from an electricity perspective and create affordability or reliability issues on our grid, um, then we lose a huge, we put at risk a huge opportunity to um, decarbonize other parts of the economy. And, if, and moving too fast for me means moving too quickly away from base load. And by base load, I mean electricity that's available, you know, around the clock, not weather dependent. Uh, and, and introducing too much of that volatility. I, th I think there's a real risk that we slow ourselves down um, because we speed ourselves up too quickly in, in the wrong areas. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, Benny, do you want to add something? Yes. If I can, just uh, one point, uh, and it's not so much a risk of transitioning too fast, but transitioning poorly. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't leave behind people or communities. You know, as we plan, 
uh, and deploy these clean technologies, we need to make sure that people and communities are able to take advantage of these opportunities equitably. And those that are negatively impacted by the transition are supported. You know, and so there's a lot of critical action that we could be taking right now. And just an example, because we were talking about the IRA, um, you know, there are mechanisms we have in Canada and the US where uh, there's clean energy tax credits that could be unlocked, another level of credits that could be unlocked if the company that's seeking these credits uh, pays their workers good wages and supports apprenticeships. Um, and there's like procurement programs that pay attention to indigenous ownership. So I think there's ways we can design transition policies that take care of people and communities. And that would be really critical part of how, do, how we do this. Awesome. I have a couple individual questions. Um, I do really want to get to the audience ones, so maybe I'll just like pop through these really quick. Um, Kim, could you tell us a little bit more about what OPG is doing to, to progress hydrogen technology in Ontario? Sure, yep. Yeah. So OPG has uh, a number of different subsidiary companies. One of them is Atura Power, and, and that is the subsidiary for us that's leading our low carbon hydrogen uh, production efforts in Ontario. So we have plans to produce hydrogen via large scale electrolysis facilities um, using OPGs and Ontario's renewable and low carbon electricity. So the first uh, facility that we plan to have online is the Niagara Hydrogen Center, and that'll be uh, located right next to our Niagara, our Sir Adam Beck uh, hydro facility. Um, and that's set to begin operations in 2024, and it'll be Ontario's first large scale site for production of clean hydrogen. Awesome. Um, actually, over to you, Jamie. When we were talking about this event um, earlier, you talked about the significance of both cybersecurity and AI, really hot topic right now. Um, what are the opportunities that exist, the challenges that exist, um, specifically in relation to the clean energy space? Yeah, good. Thank you. There's obviously this is critical infrastructure. It's it's really important with regards to protecting against cybersecurity and the risk associated with it. So there's a big investment there, and Microsoft has invested, you know, rather substantially to ensure that that security is front and center of of all technology conversations. AI is very interesting. We find ourselves really at the precipice of something transformational for the world. And I remember when I was doing my undergrad, engineering undergrad, and I got introduced to Mosaic, uh, a browser that you can go and actually find information, the information superhighway, the World Wide Web, probably dating myself massively with that. But we find ourselves in the same position with AI. And there's, there's a lot of discussion and dialogue around AI. Microsoft is 100% focused on responsible AI. We are not new to this stance. We have been doing this for years. We've leaned heavily in there, but the applications are more exciting. I know there's discussion on you know, job security and all the rest, but really what it is, is it's taking just what we do every day and to be able to use large language models to be able to just interact and get better information. This leans heavily into efficiency, productivity, safety, a number of different areas as it relates to the ener energy industry and beyond. And, and we start talking about efficiency and the essential requirement there to be more efficient, to reduce our, our carbon footprint. And as we go through the transition, that, uh, that is essential. But uh, there's a lot of examples I can get into, but I'll be respectful of time. But that is a, that is a real game changer that will, I think, drive massive uh, efficiencies and, and opportunities uh, across this sector. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm going to throw it to you, Kendall. Um, there's still questions around carbon capture's ability to deliver on the hopes that people have for the technology. Um, what what do you people need to know about its current limitations? Yeah, so CCS is not a silver bullet, right? I mean, first of all, it's highly dependent on proximity to the right geology for permanent and safe storage of the CO2. So this is not a tool that's going to work just anywhere in the world, but there are so many industries, and Benu, you mentioned a few, you know, cement, steel, oil and gas, many other what we call hard to abate sectors. In other words, even if you do have all the best intention in the world, the willingness to deploy capital and people to achieve net zero, you actually just don't have the tools and the toolkit to get there. So CCS is a great 
bridging transition technology, right? Because it can buy us time. We've got to, as fast as we possibly can, reduce our emissions going into the atmosphere. And so for some period of time, what CCS allows you to do is, instead of letting it go into the atmosphere, you put it into the geosphere and we'll store it there indefinitely. And that can buy lots of time for other technologies to come along so that we stop producing the emissions on the front end altogether. So it's not a be all end all for every single situation, but it's, I mean, you look around the world, I mean, the EU just set a quasi binding mandatory target for 50 million tons a year of CCS by 2050. They clearly see that as critical to their transition. The Americans with the IRA are putting in tons of incentives in there for CCS. So this is a global technology that will be applied across many hard to abate sectors. And again, it's not the end solution, but it can help us dramatically reduce emissions in the near term, which is clearly critical. Awesome. And Binu, uh, last one's for you. On a call preparing for this event, you mentioned that we should not only you know, be excited about technical technological innovations, but we should also focus on scaling older technologies. Um, what of these you know, older technologies do you view as untapped potential? Yeah, for sure. I love talking about unglamorous solutions, Sierra. Um, maybe uh, I want to pick on the efficiency um, measures that Jamie talked about. And another one that I'd like to talk about is transmission too. So yeah, there's a lot of potential around uh, deploying energy efficiency. So we use energy less or managing uh, demand. And so that's from a consumer perspective, just shifting the demand by 15 minutes can actually make a big difference in terms of the resources required. And Canada is actually still only scratching the surface in, in terms of these uh, solutions and the technologies are not complicated. The other really boring technology is transmission infrastructure. I mean, don't tell transmission builders that <laughs> there's still innovation happening there. Um, but, you know, it's, it's about building transmission lines that connect new clean energy sources to load centers and to industries, but also about building transmission kind of interconnections that connect our different provinces. All our provinces have slightly different energy mixes and different uh, resources. So these transmission lines will allow us to move electricity around and use the best and most cost effective resources. Um, and, you know, this is actually transmission line is one thing that every model shows as a key factor for bringing down the cost of modernizing and cleaning the economy. Um, and the barriers to these technologies is not R&D or our costs, they're all cost effective, but it goes back to what we were talking at the beginning. It's around policy and regulatory certainty. And if I could add, I think that's that's great. I apologize for jumping in, but when you get into the boring sector of, of transmission lines and being able to service them, there's leveraging again, having access to the data in order to use models to predict. And instead of being a reactionary, it's proactive in terms of how can we ensure and make sure that we've got safe workers that are going into the field, again, leveraging things like AI, where they can just use natural language and understand how to better service those poles and lines, but also use mo uh, monitoring capabilities to say, okay, there's a weather event that we can predict. How do we get ahead of it? How do we look at making sure that that is a resilient grid and we have access to that information to get ahead of it, to make sure that there's there's a consistency and efficiency, you know, there's there's a lot of applications there. Regulation absolutely needs to be there. Technology, I think, plays a, also a critical role. Thank you guys for answering all those questions. I am so excited to move forward to answering some questions from our audience. Um, we've been collecting them through the thing. We have so many good ones. Uh, so I'm just gonna pick a few. The first one that kind of caught my attention here is, is there enough focus on consumers? They have a big role to play too. Um, is anyone interested in talking first about consumers? Well, we've worked with a lot of companies, power and utility companies specifically in, in Canada that are, are, are being able to communicate and incent consumer behavior. And it's been it's it's been very positive. So having that ability to reduce the peak load, to make sure that we've got an opportunity as the energy, you know demand continues to grow 
that we can be responsible in the investments that we're making. And, uh, and, and I think we've seen some really positive uh, trends there, and I think it's going to continue and figure out how you can balance a prosumer environment where as you know, there's there's more consumers that are actually building other renewable, you know, whether it be windmills or, or whether it's specifically, you know, getting into solar or other generators that you can then put back into the grid. There's there's a lot of complexity, but, but there's a lot of investment being made there that I think will, will, will really impact positively and reduce that peak load. Awesome. Anyone else want to tackle consumers before we go on? Maybe if I can just give a shout out to the Ontario Independent Electric System Operator on this, an example of some of the work that Jamie's talking about, they just uh, finalized an ultra low rate for overnight charging. This is a great illustration of like how government can work together with, it was EV manufacturing industry that pushed for it and consumers right together, and that can help create uh, consumer change. So this is where now you can uh, shift EV charging from during the evening hours when people are back for supper to late in the night, and it snow skin off the back of consumers, but they're actually helping the grid out. So yeah, I would say they have, they have a very critical role to play. Awesome. And the next question I saw was, where do the biggest opportunities lie for businesses to reduce their energy footprint? Um, I think, especially for our audience, that will be an interesting one to answer. Um, anyone feel they wanna talk about how businesses can reduce their energy footprint? I'm happy to take an initial stab. I feel I won't spend too long on it because I, I think I'll probably be repeating a couple of the things I said earlier. But I think really that electrification um, where they can, you know, not not at all processes uh, will be feasible with current technology to to electrify. But electrification, I think, is huge and demand demand reduction, demand, uh, you know, reducing their their footprint and the efficiency. I think those are two things um, straight away that can that can make a very significant impact for businesses. Awesome. Anyone else? I can move on if no one else has comments on businesses. Um, one question comes, uh, I know we kind of mentioned this in our pre-talk, um, what role will biomass play in the energy transition? Um, anyone for that? Benu, maybe? Ooh, <laughs> it's a can of worms. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a tricky one. I think, um, I mean, we need all solutions on board, right? So I think it would definitely be part of the portfolio of solutions. I think what we need to be careful around with biomass is there is controversy around how carbon accounting works for that. Um, and, you know, in some of the IPCC scenarios and IEA as well, they talk about um combining bio biomass and bioenergy with CCUS could potentially help create negative emissions. So we just have to make sure our methodologies are right around that and they are actually resulting in emission reductions. Um, but other than that, yeah, I mean, it, it should be part of our quiver of technology solutions. I'll maybe jump on that if I can, Sierra. I, well, another thing I keep hearing, and I love this expression, is that a low carbon future is not just about electrons, it's also about molecules. And there is a certain reality that you can't electrify everything. And so knowing how to do zero carbon molecules really, really matters too. And biofuels is a, a good example of that. There's a lot of liquid fuel and use markets that will really be challenged to, to electrify. And so we've got to deliver them low carbon fuels. And I won't get into the intricacies of biomass versus other feedstocks, but biofuels writ large is a big opportunity. Hydrogen is another really big opportunity to provide a zero carbon liquid fuel to those markets, right? So um, one way or another, I think it's, um, it, as has been well, well said, this is not, in fact, when I was down in Houston at Sur Week not too long ago, um, John Podesta, who was one of the architects of the IRA, uh, made a really great statement that kind of went viral. He said, our big aha moment was when we stopped trying to decide what we needed to shut down and shifted to what do we need to build. And this is a all 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 of the above solution space, right? We need we need everything right now, including biomass and uh, a whole raft of other things. 
Uh, Kendall, I'm going to stick with you for one second. We're getting a lot of questions about CCS. Um, one question was uh, for you asking uh, that you mentioned regulate, regulatory barriers. Um, and, and they're wondering, mm -hmm. is there any indication that policies and regulations will become more supportive of CCS? Yeah, so I will speak to Alberta. Uh, we are well on our way uh, from a regulatory perspective here, but it's just like in, in nuclear is the opposite, right, Kim, where we have very little experience with that in Alberta, so it's going to be a longer um, lead time. A non-CCS jurisdiction will also take a much longer time to get those rules in place because this is sophisticated stuff. You know, you're storing CO2 underground for permanent sequestration. The measurement and monitoring and verification, that subsurface technical understanding is so critical and such a big part of the regulatory process. But fortunately, we've got multiple commercial CCS projects operating in Western Canada. The Quest project kind of paved the way from a regulatory perspective. The Alberta reg Energy Regulator has been busily um, creating, you know, fit for purpose CCS regulations to facilitate and streamline the approvals. The other thing the province did was a really brilliant job of uh, how they allocated pore space. That's where you store the CO2 geologically because in there's different ways you could do it, but that's a crown held right. And the province has doing is doing it in these orderly hub award situation. So Pathways, for example, was awarded a, a large area of storage, but we're a hub operator on behalf of any emitter in the region who wants to use that infrastructure. So instead of getting it, letting it get all parceled up and and kind of a Frankenstein kind of solution, they've done a, done a very orderly rollout of both the access to the storage space and we've got the regulatory process in place. So in Alberta, we're in, in really good shape. Other jurisdictions starting from scratch, it's going to take longer. Thank you. Um, the next question on my list is Canada's emissions regula regulations applies primarily to large emitters. How will small and mid-sized companies be affected? I'm not sure who to throw to, but uh, if anyone would be comfortable taking the first go at this, um, how small and mid companies could be affected by emission regulations. I'm happy to take it again from I can I can put an electricity lens on it because there's you know the the emissions regulations are one thing and that's for large emitters, um, but if you also take like the clean electricity regulation which is going to which is being um, crafted and will apply to electricity grids I mean I think that's one example of where the regulation that will apply to the generators and to the you know to ensure that the grid gets to where it needs to be and and small and you know mid-sized companies that are using that electricity. I think that that's in that instance how it flows through. Um, you know how they'll be affected by those. You know if they're under the threshold of those emissions regulations. I think I'm not sure how that'll trickle down directly. Um, but assuming as those uh, targets get tighter and and might apply further down the chain, uh, I do know. You know from an electricity perspective, it'll they'll take it from the system and then. That, that all work its way to, to all the users of that system. Awesome. Anyone else able to tackle this one? Um, maybe building off what Kim is saying. So I think there is might be like some transfer of costs happening to small businesses. But the other piece is also uh, opportunities that are created. So with the CER, as it uh, creates disincentives for generating emissions, it's going to generating uh, technologies is going to create incentives then for clean technologies, right? So you might see some interesting take up of uh, distributed energy, uh, small businesses investing in distributed energy resources, right? It might make for a better business case to install a rooftop solar or a heat pump for your business. Um, and uh, especially when you add the cost of carbon pricing, which will apply to most small businesses, right? So you it changes their, I think, um, business case for some of the clean energy technologies they may potentially have not invested in previously, but this creates an opportunity. But that, having said that, I would also say, this is also a reason why we need support programs for small businesses to, to bring them along and to provide the capacity that they need to take advantage of opportunities that might be out there. Awesome, thank you. I'm looking at the time and I, I feel like that's all that we got time for. So I would just like to say, you know, 
thank you on behalf of the Globe and Mail, um, Binu, Kim, Kendall, Jamie for joining us today. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone for attending and sharing those amazing questions with us. And of course, to Microsoft for supporting today's event. Um, we will be sharing a link of the recorded webcast in about one week. But uh, for now, thank you everyone for joining us and I hope you get to go and enjoy this beautiful day. Thank you. I only wish there was more time. I, I love this conversation <laughs> and I would love to get deep into so many of these topics, but thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>